Welcome to another edition of The Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer, serial entrepreneur who consults with family businesses and entrepreneurs. Please welcome Patty and Jack Phillips, authors of Show the Value of What You Do, and together they've got over 100 books published. So welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having us here. Thanks, Mark. We're happy to be here. So uh, let's start off with uh, telling us about your professional backgrounds and about the ROI Institute and why you started it. Yeah. So Jack, you want to go first? I'll go first. Um, well, I worked in the, the business world at the companies like Lockheed and uh, uh, Vulcan Materials. Uh, I started off with engineering, moved into learning and development, uh, became learning development manager, HR executive, moved into general manager, executive roles, ended my career as a president of a regional savings bank. And along the way, we develop a process to show the value of what you do um, way back in the 80s and, and even late 70s. And we documented it in a, in a book in 1983, and it caught on quite well. And so it kept growing and we kept writing, uh, applying the same process to many different applications. And then um, in 1993, we started the ROI Institute and to help people do this. So we do this globally. We have um, uh, partners all over the world. We operate in 70 countries. This evaluation system we have has now become the most used evaluation system in the world. So Patty, add to that. Yeah, so I've been involved with with the business um, for you know, over 25, almost 30 years. Um, and of course, involved with Jack as well, being my husband. But prior to all of this, I worked for a large electric utility. And in that organization, one of my roles was head of market planning and research. So we developed electric utility rates. So not sexy, but you have to have us um, if you're an electric utility. But we were doing all the customer research, the econometrics, the modeling, um, sorting out you know, which rates did what for whom. And so ROI and cost-benefit analysis and measurement was all part of what we did. And so it was a real, um, it was a good segue um, into the business that we're doing now. Now, interesting enough, my PhD is in international development. So while we work with corporate and we work with businesses primarily, um, we do a lot of work with nonprofits and non-governmental organizations because they too have to demonstrate the value of the work that they do. But ROI, cost-benefit analysis, good research methodologies have been part of what I've been involved in for a very long time. And so working with JAG, we've had the opportunity to work with companies worldwide. And um, I've seen a lot of good programming and have helped a lot of organizations, we hope, and a lot of individuals to not only show the value, but create even greater value for their, their own businesses or the businesses that they work with. And this is your 30th anniversary as a business, correct? Correct. So correct. Wow, congratulations. It's, a, it's been a great run. So why did you write this book and pick this particular title? Well, it means a question that's asked, right? You know, what value do you bring? Whether it's you, the individual, or you, the, the owner of a project or a solution. So it's not unusual these days, especially for someone to ask that question. But the reason for the book is many of our books are very technical. They're in a lot of cases, textbooks, and they're very thick, very dense, very comprehensive. There's math involved. And we knew that our audience and the audiences, um, the new audiences um, that we want to reach, we knew they needed something that was simpler and that really took our methodology and made it more consumable. So we wrote this book to include a lot of stories from different areas um, to describe what they are doing to show the value of their work. But also in the, while well, Chanda stories describe a process that people can easily use and apply. So Jack, you may want to add. Yeah, it's, it's easy. It's 150 pages. Uh, the, the opening story is about a chaplain that's trying to show the value of what he does. And he's been asked to do that all the way to ROI, if you can imagine. So it, these stories, uh, it shows you how this kind of process has helped them in their work, helped them in their career. And for some, it's even a life-changing experience. And so we thought we'd condense this down in a very readable book with very few uh, numbers in there. 
even the subject ROI frightens a lot of people. You know, one of our book titles is Show Me the Money, and that frightens people, particularly in the non-business area. And so we're trying to have a non-threatening, approachable book. And so that's what we have here. So we hope you enjoy it. Yeah, and I thought all your stories in the book, uh, your examples were very relatable examples, and they I came across as real as so many times people put examples in the books and they just make examples to fit whatever they're doing, but they're not something that they've actually tackled. Uh, what is the ROI methodology and how does that work? Yeah. So the, the process begins with a framework and the framework represents different types of data that we collect to look at value from, from multiple perspectives. So it represents a chain of impact. So as we invest in a program or a project, the first thing we have to do is get buy-in from those people who are engaged in the program or project. They have to believe this is the right thing for them, the right thing for the organization. And then they have to acquire whatever knowledge, skill, information, and insight necessary to execute the project successfully. Then they have to go do it. So they have to apply it. And as a consequence of them doing what they need to do, that's where we see the impact. And that impact is improvement in output, quality, cost, time, customer satisfaction, job satisfaction, work habits, innovation. And then we convert that to money compared to the cost. So the ROI formula is the very basic, most fundamental measure of return on investment, where we can actually compare benefits of what we do to the investment itself, and then it develops you know, the metric that comes out of it. But the idea with the framework is to ensure that we're not only collecting data from multiple perspectives or seeing value from different perspectives, but that we also have the information we need to improve whatever it is we're doing. So much of the time we're looking for a metric or an outcome, and that's important, but that's only part of the story. The, the rest of it is, okay, what are you going to do about it now? And so we're trying to ensure that using this framework, we're collecting the information we need to answer that question you know, what are you going to do about it? How can we continue this success based on whatever that output is? So it begins with that framework. And Jack, you may want to walk them through the model. Yes. Um, so just summarized, that's five levels of success that Patty's just uh, listed. Reaction, learning, application, impact, ROI. It's in any kind of project or program or initiative or system, or whatever you're doing, it's there. So how do you make it work? Is it we we have in this book we've got six steps that we follow. The first one is let's begin our evaluation, our project, our study of this. Let's begin with the end in mind, and that's getting very clear with the impact. So we start with the end in mind. The end is that impact that Patty mentioned. It's not how they react, what they've learned, what they're doing. It's the impact of this. So we start with that. It's our first step. Um, and this, the second step is how do we get there? Is this the right solution? If not, what is the solution to get there? And then next is what? What do we expect out of this? Uh, and we set clear objectives for it. And then we put the project in place and then we collect data. We call it how much? How much did these measures change? Reaction, learning, application, impact. And then as we collect that data, we're thinking, you know, was it worth it? This is where we take the impact data, going to convert it to money, compare it to the cost of the program, calculate the ROI. That's basically answering the question, was this worth it? And then the last step is leverage it. What can we do with that? And the book has great examples of people have ledger, leveraged their, their particular uh, project to get more funding, to get more support, uh, to improve their career, um, to get all kinds of good things just by showing the value of what you do with a particular project or a program. That's a long an uh, answer to your short question, Mark. I'm sorry. Yeah, but you you both come are very both very quantitative and the people who lead organizations are also typically quantitative. And so your process and methodology and how you measure things is like an ideal fit, especially today when uh, that's really the, the strong focus of every leader because they're trying to run as efficiently as possible. And that's what I, I took away a lot of how your methodology and process allows companies to run more efficiently. And that's the intent, right? It's right. like, how can we improve things so we can run 
more efficiently, get it done faster, quicker, with higher quality, but also ensure that our employees are happy about doing it, right? So we include that employee aspect to it too. So yes, it's all about efficiency while ensuring we have a culture where employees can thrive. And so the data we're collecting is allowing people to look at that and look through success through those multiple lenses. So how do you get employees to see that activity, as you write, without purposeful consequences means little? It's just saying you're busy. And a lot of people feel like, hey, I'm, I'm very busy and they're in meetings and, and they're producing stuff, but the stuff is kind of worthless. And you always hear that, especially the larger the corporation, the more you hear that. Well, yes, we, we sometimes substitute activities for results. We want to at least. And, but we have to keep reminding people, it's not what you're doing, but it's a consequence of that that's important. You see, when you ask the sales team, so how were your sales last week? And if the sales are not so good, they often say, well, you know, I call these many customers and I had these many conversations, have these many demos. They're, they're describing activities. Well, that's necessary to get to where you need to be, but it's not what you really need to have at the end. So if you just think about how performance of people have changed over the years in terms of our performance management system. You know, we used to start off with that reaction. We want people with a good attitude. See, that's that's important. It's how they're reacting to the work and how we see that, them reacting to the work. Then we want learning. That is, we want credentials and degrees and certifications and experiences. So they bring a lot of knowledge and skills. But then we want them to do things. And so many performance appraisals years ago was around, you communicate well, you follow up well, you you, you know, you're a good team member, you know. So, yes, that's important. But now performance appraisal systems and performance management systems are focusing on the impact. You do that for this. So until we put that in front of them and say, really, your success has to be at the impact level. Otherwise, it, we're wasting our time. We've got to get that. That's why we exist. And so we have to constantly remind them. And then when we, if we can reward them, with that in mind, that makes a big difference. So it's the, constantly reminding them, hey, that's an activity. I want to see the consequence of that activity. Yeah, I, I don't think from what I read, it's not that you're putting the salespeople or, or anybody who's doing something on the spot. You're trying to help them figure out how they can be successful and why isn't it being successful? Because you can have salespeople who are fabulous, but if the product isn't right, the price isn't right, there's so many variables, but your system actually helps them figure that out so that they can have success because who wants to do all that work and come at the end of the day and not get the sale and not feel good about it? Yeah, right. That's right. It's like, how, how can they be successful? But then also how, they, how can they communicate that success so it resonates with the people questioning their success? So it, so if you deliver a successful project, most people want to copy the formula, but you write about improving it. How do you get employees to focus on a constant state of improvement? You know, it's always like, hey, the wheel isn't broken. Uh, why fix it? Hey, that's yeah. a big issue. It is Process big. improvement is the number one reason we'd like to do, for people to do this. Make it better. It's particularly important when your project's not working so well. We have to find out why and we correct it. But even if it's successful, we want to make it better. So uh, we often use the term black box thinking. You know, bring that to your 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 program and projects because in that black box thinking from the airline industry, we know how that's worked quite well to prevent accidents, making airplane airline travel the face uh, the safest travel in the world and also the safest place you can be. So it got there by that relentless focus on improving things and making things better. So we bring that mentality to the process and you, you begin to see uh, success or lack of success along the way. You know, if the reaction is not what we need, we got to work on that. If the learning is not there, we got to work on that. If the, if the application is not there, we got to get that fixed before we get to the impact. So it's just thinking, fix it along the way, but always use process improvement at the end. And that it's not so hard, Mark, when they evaluate their work, their project or program, their work, 
and the ROI is negative. That's not hard for them to say, oh my gosh, how can we fix it? Where we struggle is when it's positive and when it's really positive because they say, okay, we're successful, check the box. And that's not what we want to do because there's always going to be an opportunity to improve. And the question is, even if you're getting high ROIs for your effort now, is it going to continue down the road? And what's going to change? And what are some, you know, situations or risk out there that could change this. So it is hard, as Jack said, to get people to think process improvement, because when we're successful, we just check the box. We've been successful, but there's always opportunity to tweak it. Can we be a little more successful? And that's why we talk a little bit about it in this book and then in more detail on some of the others, you know, setting those targets for success, setting the objective for what we're doing setting the target, and then always moving the needle up a little bit as we meet that target. And that's often hard for people to do because they'll set up an ROI of 25% and it's always there. Well, you got an ROI of 25% today. Can we move that up a little bit next time? So it's getting people to think about moving the needle and stretching just a little bit further, even when they are successful. How do you, uh, when you're talking to leaders of companies, and how do you get them to be realistic about whatever they're doing, because sometimes you'll hear employees complain that, you know, the goal they set is just not attainable. Yeah, you should always shoot for more and fall somewhere in between, but it, it's so frustrating for some employees that they think uh, everything is asked for is unrealistic. So how do you either go and share the leadership about how to do the planning where you can show the, the employees that this, uh, plan is realistic and can be accomplished or get them to uh, see through your system that it's unrealistic to put such a heavy burden on the employees and how, how do you how do you do that so we have some rules for setting objectives in our in our book so we think we look at an objective we set is a minimum level of performance then we bring in the concept of stretch objectives and it's for the leaders to 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 try to encourage people to stretch themselves, but it, reminding them it's not a performance review here. If you don't meet it, you you're not penalized on this. But getting people to stretch, and they often do. But the goal itself has to be owned by the people who can make it happen. So it's mutual goal setting that goes in place here. So it's not something we're forcing on a person, but we explain why and and let that person ask questions and and ideally coming even from them what they think would be possible. But again, we set an objective by definition, an objective at any of these levels, whether it's reaction learning, application and impact, it's our minimum acceptable number that we all agree that we should achieve. But then let's try to do more. And you don't get penalized if you don't. You're probably going to get rewarded if you do. So you've got to have that kind of setting and that kind of situation to be successful with it. It's, Patty, it's, also, it's also a, a matter of just having, having the conversations. As Jack said, you know, the senior executive has a goal. I want this. I want to meet this goal. Okay, that's good. If we don't, what would be minimally acceptable? Is that minimally acceptable? Is that what you want? And then when they put it out there, having the conversation about, okay, this is our target. Now, here's what has to happen to achieve the target. One example of Years ago, we were, and I remember this conversation so clearly because it was just so evident what was happening. One senior executive was saying, you know, you're just spending too much time in meetings. You're just wasting too much time in meetings and there's nothing to be done about it. And we don't want your help and all this kind of thing. And just really off the, off the charts there. But having a conversation with that senior leader, our client, really listened to what the problem was and sorted out what the real issue was. It wasn't about meetings and it wasn't about the job. It's just that the efficiency of what they were doing was lacking. And so she had the conversation with the senior executive, said, okay, what is the target ROI? If you invest this money in this solution, what do you hope to achieve from an ROI? And he gave her the target and she said, okay, to do this, here's what we have to do. And so getting that senior executive to buy in into their role in achieving that target is an important conversation. And too much of the time we skip the conversation and we say, okay, now we're in panic mode because the executive wants this. How are we going to get it done? 
rather than have that, you know, it's a difficult conversation sometimes, but you have to know and go, go to the executive with that plan. Okay, we can do this if these things happen. Now, if these don't happen, here's what we're looking at. So it's scenario, you know, scenario planning. It's here's what we're trying to do. And I just think sometimes people are afraid to have that, you know, it's a tough conversation sometimes. They're afraid to do it. And they take what that senior executive is asking for when sometimes that senior executive may not have thought it out either. And we've seen that conversation derail that thought process and is an opportunity. Before I get into the question from the uh, audience, uh, what would you be telling Elon Musk, you know, what he's done with Twitter because he's let go of 80% of the employees and, we, and uh, sales are down from 5 billion to 3 billion. How would you have told him to, that you could help him get to the right number? Because I had a guy on the show and he was a, a strategist and, he's, and he had been in the Navy. And he said, in the Navy, we start with the minimum amount of people uh, in any running any ship or whatever. And then we find out how many do you actually need as opposed to putting in a, a large number of people and then whittling it down. So seeing what's happened there, and I don't know if you can answer that question, but maybe you have some thoughts on it. What, do you, what would you advise him to do or what would you have advised him to do uh, when he took over? Yeah, I, if in the book, we actually take leadership and, and say, let's look at that around these five levels of success. You know, it, think about a leader. The first level is reaction. How do people react to you? And that has to be positive or at least respectful uh, to be able to move on down the other levels. The second one is, are, do they learn something for you? What are they taking away from you? Uh, and, you know, that's we call a very smart or intelligent leader. Um, by the way, the first one, the re good reaction, we often say, uh, you know, this is a a person who can has a lot of charisma. And then let's go to level three. A good leader is going to influence people to do things. They become influencers to get people to do things. And level four is impact. They're actually driving the impact that we need. Um, and that's critical. Uh, that success often that'll sustain your 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 job often. And then finally, is it worth it? That is the what you're putting into it as a leader. Is it worth it for you? Uh, what you're getting out of it, and is it worth it for the people who are following you? So our advice for Elon is to he's focusing so much on level four and five impact and ROI. He's losing some on the lower side. That is, he probably doesn't have the respect and support of the team. If you lose that, then you've probably lost them as key contributors. Um, they're there because they have to be there, not because they want to be there necessarily. And so they're probably not learning a lot from him because he's got all the answers himself. And, he, and he's telling them what to do, maybe, but maybe without explaining it. Um, and I and I think he's probably short on influence, how he can get people to step up and do things. So I think he needs to work on level one, two, and three. He's already got four and five down quite well. So we we define a courageous a courageous uh, leader as one that works all five levels. The, and you say these days you got to deliver on five five levels. And we just wrote a, a article for a magazine called Leader to Leader published by the, the Drucker Institute and, and John Wiley. And in that, we, we give an example of someone that, that, that we all know quite well who really does a great job of all five levels. We also give some examples of some that failed at different levels. But one of those, in our mind, is Howard Schultz with Starbucks. He's got respect as he started at Starbucks and grew it. He's come back now twice as a interim CEO. Now he's stepping down again uh, for a new CEO to take over, but he got great reaction. He taught people a lot about the business and what they uh, what needs to be done, and he influenced them to do amazing things, and the results was it grew and was very profitable. And 
it was certainly good for the stake for the shareholders. That's a, what it, was it worth it? So, so you got to work on all five levels. And Elon's a little short on those three lower three levels, I would say. And the other piece of it is, is is the workforce planning itself, because all the tech companies laying off, so many of them just hired a bunch of people when they could. And it, it's not can you, it should you. And so really taking workforce planning seriously, it used to be in big corporate, uh, strategic workforce planning was an important element. And then it went away. The focus of real workforce planning sort of faded away. Well, now it's coming back. And so we have the opportunity to work with a lot of uh, leaders of people analytics within these big corporations. And for many of them, they are in the, in the grind of workforce planning and really looking at what workforce data, uh, workforce resources do we need. And the data they have today is you know, much greater than what we had 20, 30 years ago when we were doing it. They're looking at the data, but sometimes data alone is so misleading we have to look not just at data points, but at the context. And I remember someone uh, quoted a, a former executive for a healthcare organization, Orlando. He and I were having a conversation and he said, you know, I don't know anything until I know content and context. So you may have the data telling you something, but you, sometimes you really need to kind of drill down and see what's really happening within the organization as well, external to the organization. So focus on workforce planning is really important. You know, in the midst of all of these tech layoffs, Jack and I have been having a lot of those conversations about how did you end up with so many people in the first place? You know, you just made a decision to hire all these people and now you're letting them go. Who's winning there? Um, yeah. And then, of course, we're seeing the layoffs occur in, in other industries as well today. I, I think when we look at uh, some of these companies like Lyft and Uber and uh and even Twitter or any of these, we wondered how many people does it really take to run an app? I mean, like, you know, they don't have, they don't barely have any customer service. It's matching. They don't have any assets per se, besides the computers. And we're always left scratching our heads about like, did they really need 8,000 people to run this thing? I mean, it seems to be able to go on its own. And I guess that's what he drew, but you wonder if he drew that conclusion, not because he thought, he had the downsize, but because he was forced to from a cash flow standpoint. So it's interesting. Question from the audience. How do you distinguish between what is uh, within control of the manager and what is not? Impact of the pandemic, regulatory changes, technology developments. In other words, targets are not really in isolation in the real world. That's right. true. Yeah. I'd say... One, one of our rules for objectives is to be flexible, to make adjustments or changes as you need to be, because things happen beyond your control, both both upside and downside. So you got to make, make adjustments in those goals when that happens. And that's typically what's done. Uh, if not, it certainly should be. So we got to be, they, they can't be rigid that can cannot change. It needs that flexibility. And, you know, and to Jack's point, it's about, you know, expecting perfection. It's not. I mean, if you're an accounting, work in finance, you're forecasting on January 1st and the end of the month, you close the books and reforecast. It's, it's a, you know, things happen. So I, my dad taught me when I was a kid, you know, plan in pencil because that's what you're doing. Things are going to change. We work with um, a lot of uh, pharma companies. And so I was working with one of our pharmaceutical clients and she was showing the impact of a sales program and looking at the impact on sales. So as Jack said, we have a process to sort out what the other effects are. And she had done everything except the COVID factor. And so she was showing this program had tremendous impact on sales using techniques to isolate the effects of the program. So she did a good job there except for COVID factor. I said, go talk to you know, your finance people because they have one. Because we know all these organizations that saw that huge increase in sales, they weren't going to get that normally. That's COVID or the decrease, right? It hit us both ways. And so is it going to be perfect? No, it's not going to be perfect. We do have to account for real world. And I think with the pandemic, you know, we've learned, okay, there's another thing out there we need to think about, but it's it's doing the best we can given the information we have at hand and knowing that if we 
miss a target? Let's take a look. Why did we miss it? What happened? And readjust. Another question from the audience. Is it fair to assume implementing your formula is doable for big organizations with big budget to measure and improve performance? Could you please explain how the same formula and plan could be implemented in smaller businesses with many part-time employees to generate better performance and increase efficiency? Yes. Well, we work with both, but it's a good point. Uh, larger organizations do get more involved in this because they've got so much at stake, but it works quite well for a small business. What, what, we, what, we, what we want people to do is to think ROI. Um, if you're a small business manager and you want to uh, buy some new technology, uh, you, we're thinking through how will my team react to it? That's level one. Is it easy for them to learn it? That's level two. Can they use it? And what does their use look like? Can I get there? And what impact will it have when I do that? And that impact when converted to money uh, helps me think through, is it worth what I'm paying for it? So you may not do the analysis. You may not collect a lot of data, but if you think through it, uh, it might, might make you more effective, more efficient. Now, we work with uh, a, a restaurant in Baltimore that was going to go cashless. Uh, and so they, before, before they did that, they went through this whole issue. How will it's going to affect the customers? How is it going to affect the employees? They were doing this primarily because of robberies. Uh, with cash in their restaurant, they were being robbed. Uh, but they... If I make it by going cashless, that, that obviously cut out the, ro the robberies. But at the same time, you don't want to lose customers. Um, and you you don't want to lose employees. So they they did this thinking all the way through. It actually forecasts the ROI of going cashless before they made that decision. Then they could track it afterwards and make sure that it was the right solution. I'd, I'd be happy to send that little case study. That's just a small cafe shop in Baltimore. So it can work with small business, but we have to think they don't have the resources for a lot of analysis, but they do make decisions around marketing and technology and their employees and new systems and new processes they put in place. We just want ROI thinking to be in place. Think ROI. And you think through this chain of how it's going to work for you, but the key decision maker is going to be the impact and ROI. Even if you don't do the calculation, in numbers, you're going to do it mentally. Just like when we purchase something, we're going through the calculation, is this worth what I'm paying for it? So we want that thinking to go through, but follow this chain of value here, chain of impact. It's a logical chain there. Patty, you, uh, you wrote words? about different perspectives of value related to success, like happiness, commitment, motivation, learning, habits, behavior, impact, and consequences. Why are these important? And what if you can't include something like happiness in the recipe for the project? Does that decrease the chances for success? Because I think we're finding out that leadership isn't caring right now so much about happiness. I think that's a great, that's a great question. And it, and it aligns a little bit with, with the question in the chat about ROI is always measured by money. ROI is a formula. I mean, the, the it, it's my standard, it is, it's a formula, it's benefits compared to cost, so it is money, but benefits and impact, not necessarily, so when we look at these other measures, these intangible measures, they're not discounted, um, they're just as important, equally as important as that ROI, and there are some measures that we will make a conscious decision not to convert to money. Um, in terms of these measures not being as important, it depends on the company because many companies are trying to do both. They're trying to do, do well, so ROI, um, and do good while they're doing it. So taking care of their people, making sure they're happy, making sure they have the culture. So it's that balance between doing good and doing well. Jack, you were about to say, I think I jumped in on you. Oh, yes. I mean, the, in, the intangibles can oh, even overcome the ROI calculation or replace the ROI calculation. See, if it's negative, or ROI, you may have some huge intangibles that that's okay because those are not converted to money. I'll give you an example. In the book, we've got a case study of a, 
a SWAT team for a Kansas City Police Department. Um, the leader of that SWAT team decided uh, to try a new approach. It's based on an outward mindset mentality. And that team was getting complaints, about 35 complaints a year from the citizens, complaints of excessive force. Now, they were very expensive complaints because it was average in the city about $70,000 per complaint. So they tried this new process, a new approach. It took three days of training for the team to get there, but they changed their approach. Complaints went away. The ROI was huge, just an unbelievable ROI number. But when we presented that data to this leader, Chip Huth, here's what he said. Jack, that's impressive, but the more important data is the in increase in trust from the communities. They, they did some surveys and they see that that trust is going up from based because of this program. He said, to me, that's more important. And we would agree with him. It's not all about the money necessarily. Yes, the ROI is the money. For those who need the cost versus benefit, it's there. But let's don't underestimate the power of those intangibles. Those intangibles we define as a measure that we're not converting to money because we couldn't get there credibly or with a reasonable amount of time. They're still powerful and they're gonna make a big difference in our project. Uh, it, it's a question from the audience. Is ROI always measured by money and the case studies your uh, colleague put in that all you have to do is email info at uh, roiinstitute.net, correct? Yes, that's correct. That last so, case uh, study, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to send you that case study. It's actually being published in a book that'll be out next month. That Kansas City SWAT team. It's amazing to see what happened there. Be happy to send you that case study. You can actually come to just either one of us, Jack at roiinstitute.net or Patty, P A T T I, at roiinstitute.net. And, and so, so is, is ROI always measured by money? Yeah, the ROI calculation is money comparing cost versus uh, the benef benefits, benefits versus cost. But it's only one of six types of data. Remember, you've got reaction, learning, application, impact, ROI, and you've got intangibles. Intangibles are the impacts not converted to money. Six types of data. It's only one of those data sets. And we'll go back to the creators of ROI in the finance accounting literature. And, and it was there for capital expenditures. So that's like buildings and tools and equipment. Now, what the in the finance and accounting text, here's what they say about ROI. It's an imprecise measure. It should never be used alone to make a decision. And we agree. Hey, it, it is based on data that may not be as precise as we'd like. There, we even put error adjustments in, in our analysis to make it uh, su make it supported and incredible. But it is an imprecise measure. But the key thing is don't make a decision on ROI. We have to remind people, you've got six types of data. You see, if that SWAT team example had been negative, but you've got more trust from the community with the police, hey, that's worth it. We just can't get that to money. So don't make a decision about a program based on the ROI alone. So that's a great finance and accounting conclusion with the creators of this process. We'll bring it forward in today's climate and it works quite well. Um, there are five levels of proje uh, project success according to your book, which are reaction and planned action, learning, application, implementation, impact and return on investment. Why did you pick these levels and do you get management to include them into their planning for any project? And how long does this take to implement or are there shortcuts to achieve the same result? All right. So, Patty, I'll start with this. Um, it's a logic flow of data. We, we, we go, we take it back to the 1800s in our first reference to that logic model. It's a logic model that is logical flow of data. That is, you're going to have a negative ROI. If, if you don't have the impact. And you won't have the impact if you don't have application because that's what drives the impact. You won't have application unless you learn how to do it. That's what drives application. So one level, level leads to the next. So it's a logical flow, logic model. That, and it, 
it's most evaluation systems in the world work off of the logic model. That's why we use it. Now, is it applied on every, every process? We want people to think that way, but the analysis is not necessary for, for most of what we do. In fact, for a given set of programs, we want to keep the use of ROI to a small number. And it's those that are most expensive, most important to you, maybe connected to strategy, those that will attract a lot of interest. Maybe you're solving some major problem or you're taking advantage of a major opportunity. So we want to be very selective when we do this analysis, but just for a small number of projects. Patty, add to that if you could. And to your question, do um, you know, do we require it? Uh, managers to use. And as Jack said, we're looking at the, the big projects, but the framework is not just about the result of the projects. We use this framework as the basis for understanding what solutions and change needs to occur. So if you flip those levels upside down, it begins with, you know, what is our opportunity to make money, save money, avoid cost, and do greater good while making money, saving money, avoiding costs. What is out there that we don't have? Or is there money on the table that, that we're leaving or something costing us too much? So what's that opportunity? And then what are the specific business measures that need to improve that will help us move toward taking advantage of that opportunity? So for example, you may be a business and you have incredible absenteeism. I mean, people just aren't showing up for work and when they don't show up for work, it's costing you a lot of money. So what is the specific business measure that needs to improve? Was well, that unexpected absence? We need to do something about that. So we really start with that ROI and business impact up front. As Jack said, that's the first step in the process is why aren't we doing this in the first place? Because we have an opportunity to make money, save money, avoid cost and do greater good while making money, saving money, and avoiding costs, and then define the business measures. And then from there, we start sorting it out. Okay, well, what is happening or not happening that if we change it can help us improve those business measures? And then what is it people need to know to make that change? And how can we roll it out so that people know what they need to know to make the change that needs to be made so we can improve the business measure and then take advantage of the payoff opportunity. So that framework, those five steps, we start using those on the front end to sort out, why are we doing what we're doing? What is the right solution for addressing the why? How do we roll it out so people know what they need to know to do what we want them to do so we can improve it? And then you put in your strategy, whatever the solution is, whether it's a marketing strategy or a training program for your leaders, whatever it is, set it up for success with those targets, those objectives and targets. And then evaluating the success is really quite easy when you do it that way, because you know what your success looks like at all levels. So the, the framework is really a key piece in all of this, because it allows us to define success from these different perspectives and follow this logic that's been with us forever. I mean, you do it already. We do it all we all do it. We just don't know we're doing it. Because the first thing we do is you see, you know, a book on a shelf. It's like, oh, interesting book. That's relevant to my needs. Okay, that's level one. You flip through it to learn more. You either buy it or you don't. So that chain of impact is occurring even in, even in ourselves. Today, we're just formalizing it and then use it before we invest in solutions and then use it as the basis for evaluating the success of the solutions. Um, you mentioned the question in every management book that is the value of leadership. You always see, see you know, that that's a big question for people. How do you value leadership and what is the profile which you list in the book of what a good leader looks like now, today, 2023? Yeah, it's, I'd say to, to deliver on all five levels. It goes back to the Elon Musk example. You see, we, we want reaction, a great reaction from a leader. They, it, the people who are following this leader need to have some respect for this person. Uh, otherwise, they'll be disregarded. They got to learn from this leader, learn something about the situation and what they have to do, what needs to be done. So it has to be great learner, learning, but probably one of the key things is influencer. 
A leader's got to influence people to take action and do things. And then ultimately, the leader is going to drive impact, impact for the organization. We know a lot of leaders get fired because they don't deliver the impact. And then is it worth it? It's got to be worth it for the leader, worth it for the organization that the leader's involved in, and worth it for the people who are following the leader. Uh, that's the ROI. Whether you calculate that or not, it needs to be there. So we 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 define uh, an ex exceptional leader as one that looks at all five levels. So many might focus on just charisma and try to be someone that everyone loves. Um, some are very smart and they want to remind everyone how smart they are, but they just don't deliver on some of the other things. You really need all of those. You got to have a direct right reaction, learning, application from your leadership that is doing something, have impact, and make it worthwhile for everyone involved. Worth it, ROI. Uh, should leaders be trained differently today than in the past? And has the pandemic affected the way leaders are trained? Well, I think the pandemic has changed a lot of ways. We've all been trained, right? It just changed so much of what we do. But uh, today, what the trend for leaders is, it's not putting someone in a program. It's really about maybe giving them some information, some insights, some new skills, but putting them with their peers and their colleagues. So peer learning has become a huge part of leadership development, whether they're with their colleagues, from whether it's different industries or within the organization. But much of what we're involved in is they're coming together through councils and exchanges that other organizations are offering and these leaders come together and they learn from each other. So I think that yes, leaders do need to be trained differently than they have been in the past. Um, but I think that's happening. And I think the pandemic led us to that where peer learning, uh, more of the experiential learning, put them to work, give them the skills and get them out there and let them develop and use those skills and create change. And part of the change in leadership development is a focus on what matters most? Why are we doing it? So it's going into these developmental programs with a clear reason why. It's not about behavior change. It's about the consequence of their behavior change and allowing them to see what, what measures do we need to improve that by changing my leadership style, changing what I do can help us improve those measures. So it's much more intentional, much more purposeful going into a leadership development program with a clear reason why I'm doing it. Not just that I'm going to know my personality type and I'm going to be doing these things differently, but why am I going to be doing it and getting that buy-in from leaders first, but then also connecting them with their colleagues and their peers so they can learn from each other. Is, Jack, is there any, Jack, I, Jack's sorry. about to say, no, he was about to say something. Sorry. Go ahead, Jack. I was going to mention a couple of things. The content has changed a little bit because of the pandemic. There's a little more focus on things like empathy and, and inclusion. Uh, and then technology-based learning has not always done well for teaching soft skills, uh, but we're getting better at that. Uh, and that's improving. So the pandemic has caused us to focus on that in a bigger way. But we still have to make sure it works as well. We've got to make sure it works on the, all the levels that not just behavior change that we after, but the consequence of the behavior. That's the impact. And yes, ROI, if, it, if it's a huge investment and you, you'd like to see if it's worth it. So that's that's just, it, it's good news of what's happening and, and we're, we're adjusting to it quite well. A uh, question from the audience. How do you measure charisma? Well, it well, starts with a definition. Of charisma. I mean, any, any measure, any construct like, you know, charisma or even ex experience, you know, you have to first define it. What do you mean by charisma? And then to measure it, there's, you know, two ways. One is measuring charisma. So start with a definition. What does that construct look like? Um, what does that, that measure look like? Defining it. And then you, you know, you can measure it the same way we do customer satisfaction. You can measure it with a survey and get opinion and all that. But what we really want to look for is not just measuring charisma, but the consequence of charisma. So someone may meet the definition, whatever your definition of charisma is, but so what? Okay, what's the consequence of that? 
And Jack, you may want to add to that. Right. That's a critical thing is how do you measure it? Like happiness. You know, we've been involved in putting monetary value on happiness. But it goes back to what's the definition. One of the interesting definitions comes from the United Nations in their United Nations Happiness Index. For six years in a row, Finland has been the top on happiness. But if you look at the definitions, it's kind of interesting. You may have some different definitions there. But the key is, if you're going to measure something like charisma, if you define it, and it's going to be someone's perception. So it's going to be a perceived value. Uh, you can measure it, obviously, on a five-point scale or in some other kind of scale, but you you can get there. Definition is the critical thing. Define it so that people understand what you're actually asking for. It, it, Jack, is there, uh, and Patty, is there a leader or a couple leaders that you look at that we watch on a daily basis you say, man, this person really is a great leader. And maybe you can't tell because you're not working with them, but... Uh, on the surface, just like, you know, we think some coach is great because they won a national championship or whatever. Is there any uh, leaders, political, sports, uh, business that you look at and say, these are folks that really know how to lead? Yeah. I think two come to mind, in my my opinion, Howard Schultz, as I mentioned before, and and also Tim Cook with Apple. Uh, it, it, from we we work with both of those companies, uh, incidentally, and and so we, I think they they seem to bring all the five levels that we talk about. Patty, you want to add one, two? You know, it's a great question, Mark. It's who do we see, and we can be very judgy, right? Almost it's almost easier to answer the question: who aren't the good leaders in our opinion? Uh -huh. Um, but there's one person, there's several people that I think about, and they're not necessarily known like, you know, Howard Schultz and all, but um, but as a person, there's several, but one person that just comes to mind is a, is a person that you may remember. Um, he ran for president and he's a huge military presence is General Wesley Clark. And the reason I say General Wesley Clark is because he is focused on outcomes. He can rally people around him to get things done. He has created a program called Renew America Together. And as part of that is a new kind of leadership development. It's called Civility Leadership Institute. It's a new way of developing leaders. And he is inviting people from across the, the U.S. He's looking for a very diverse group. So he's embracing diversity of this, these cohorts he wants people from across aisles. He wants red states, blue states. You know, he's looking at gender differences. He's looking at race, nationality differences, where they work differences. And he's creating these leadership development cohorts to deliver impact. And he's not afraid to hold them accountable. And I think leaders like that, he's got a clear vision what he's going for here. And it's to create change by helping people develop skill so they can find common ground, stop this grind, stop this anxiety that we as people are causing. Let's figure out the skills we need to find this common ground so we can create impact. But what I like about his leadership, it's not um, just who he is. And it's not that you know, he has the charisma, right? He's not just has the, but he's really holding people accountable to this. And he's saying, we need to create change and I want to see results and we're going to hold you accountable to this. And I think that's what great leaders are, regardless of where they work and, you know, what party they're in is, can we come get people to come together, stop dividing them because both sides are dividing. They're all divisive. Can we pull people together who are coming from all these different areas, who come from all these different thought processes and and views and, you know, some grew up with wealth and some grew up with nothing and still have nothing. And he's bringing them together to give them the skills to do this. I think that is what a great leader is. People who can pull us all together for a common goal and get things done. I think that's a great definition. Um, a question from the audience. You mentioned you need charismatic leaders to bring about impact and changes. Are there any checklists for charismatic leaders in business? I mean, I think the checklist would be for any kind of, I mean, I don't, again, define what you mean by 
charismatic leader. Well, I guess right. you have to define that first. You sure. have to find that first, but I think a there, checklist for any leader would be very similar. Let, let me I'm, let me um, fine tune that for just a minute. What I'm suggesting, if you look at those levels, reaction, learning, application, impact, ROI. For reaction, uh, we need a positive reaction to our leader. And we look at things like uh, they um, make me feel important. Uh, they make it relevant to me. They make it something I want to do. They make it something that that I want to support. Uh, and, and they make me feel good about myself. Now, to do that, uh, we often label that a charismatic leader that is someone that can really we respect and and motivate us to do that um you know it doesn't mean necessarily high charisma however you want to define that but just being able to earn the respect of people and have them treated the way they need to be that's important because if you don't you just uh, you don't go to that extra mile uh for this leader uh an introvert uh, can can be a great leader. They, I would say, the charismatic leader may be more like an, an extrovert. But my point is, an introvert can too. We just look at what is it you want to define that reaction that we want. Uh, there's probably uh, some checklists of uh, the qualities of a good leader. I think I remember that from some of our studies uh, that you could think about. But but I want to, our focus should be on down the, the chain, impact. I mean, we, we've seen charismatic people who fail to deliver results and they get fired. The CEO of H, HSBC was fired because he couldn't deliver results, but the employees loved him, but he couldn't get them to do things that he needed to do. And therefore the impact wasn't there. He ignored the results. And he, they got fired. So you got to have it all. Uh, you just you don't want it doesn't have to be so high in charisma, but it, it can't be a turnoff person in, in that. And that's that's probably where Elon falls short, because he probably doesn't earn the respect from a lot of people that he needs to. Yeah. And I think, um, too, you know, be, being careful with charismatic leaders, because there have been a many charismatic leaders that took some folks down the wrong path, too. So I think we have to define what do you mean by charisma um and then what is the intent you know what's the consequence we're looking for to get there I, but but in the end i think there's a common checklist among all leaders you know what leaders can do to be better leaders and drive outcomes that matter to the organization and the employees and as well as the community so mark sorry I, I, I think you're right positive outcomes because yeah. i mean certainly hitler was more than charismatic and had negative uh That's outcomes right. Uh, that affected the entire world. Um, and we're almost running out of time, but maybe this is a good last question to ask you. Where does artificial intelligence fit into project management and leadership decisions? I think everybody is worried about ch uh, chat box and, uh, and all those type of things. So where do you see artificial intelligence fitting into project management and leadership decisions? Well, I think the genie is out of the box on that one. It is here. I think what's important is that we know how to leverage it and use it in a fair way. So fair AI is a big conversation that we're having with some of our colleagues and our clients. How can we discern um, first, how can we really take advantage of it, the positives, but then how can we understand what it's doing and how it's doing it without having to be the technology people but really understanding what fair use of AI is all about. Yeah, it, it's a, obviously it's, it's designed to support what we do, not replace individuals necessarily, not in our kind of profession at least, but it, it can add to the process. We know that having artificial intelligence for the coaching process is, is proven to be effective. Uh, in our new book coming out next month on proving the value of leadership development, we've got a case study there uh, showing the value of, of 
AI use as the coaches. So the coaches are robots, essentially. And, and what we see is that they are just as effective, if not more, than the humans. And they did it cheaper. Uh, so they're, they're, that could be a replacement for a coach. Um, so I, I think we've got to be concerned about some things, about replacing jobs. But at the same time, we might need to, particularly if we don't have um, enough of people in certain jobs. Um, but it's it's a debate, and it's really a serious one that needs to happen, and it is happening. Um, it's it's very interesting to us because uh, we we find it supports what we do. We we actually do the Chat GPT for how do you measure the ROI on whatever, and we're interested in those responses. It doesn't quite parallel what we do. It's not as thorough as what we do, and. You wouldn't expect it to be, but it gets at some of the key issues. So it's a lot of interesting stuff there. I think it can support us, but it's a long way from replacing us, I think. Yeah, I think it's not going to replace us. It's just going to not replace us. It's, it may replace some of the activity that we're involved in, because I can see it replacing some of the work, especially with, with, with so much writing that we do. It can replace some of the initial work but it's not going to write the report completely and it's not going to write the book completely but that and that's chat gpt i think with um all of ai it's i don't think we're going to lose jobs i think our jobs are going to we're going to reinvent our jobs we're going to have to learn some new skills but that has happened with every evolution of technology this is not new right I mean, they, yep. we remember when the ATM machines came out. Well, you, you guys, none of you are old enough to remember the ATM machines came out. But that yeah. was a big, and people were afraid. That was going to take away the job of the teller. It didn't. And so I just think that we just have to, you know, be excited about it. Because now we get to learn new things and build skill and take on new activities and jobs and roles. Patty and Jack, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. We look forward to the next book. Got to have you. Uh, back again. So I appreciate it. I hope you all have a great weekend. And um, thank you for joining us today. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks, Mark, for having us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. See you all next Friday. Thank you.